Beyond the Wood Stove. We've got a great session lined up for you. Um, before I introduce the panel and, and tee things up, um, I work for an organization called the Biomass Energy Resource Center. It's actually a program of BEIC, the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. Um, been working in uh, wood energy for about uh, 15 years. And uh, we have an exciting panel. Uh, we're going to be covering uh, some ground, touching on wood heating, but also uh, really drilling into some innovations in combined heat power. So an opportunity for uh, producing both heat and power simultaneously. Uh, we've got a panel of uh, folks who are represent companies that make and uh, distribute technology, uh, institutions that utilize this technology, and also a, uh, a utility that has uh, innovative programs that are aimed at um, helping the forest products industry uh, save money, use less fossil fuel uh, by utilizing electricity as an alternative to, to fossil fuels. So, uh, great panel. Um, just to, to frame things up and provide a little context, Vermont is a national leader in the use of wood heat and wood energy. Uh, we have a huge opportunity to expand its use. Uh, here in Vermont, we have uh, a goal of doubling the amount of wood heat in the state by the year 2035. Uh, recently, a uh, Working Lands Enterprise Board funded uh, roadmap was, uh, was completed in partnership between Renewable Energy Vermont and the Biomass Energy Resource Center, looking at a pathway of how we can get from where we are today at 21% of our thermal energy needs for wood heat. Uh, to achieve 35% by the year 2035. Uh, this dovetails into our uh, total renewable energy target, the ambitious uh, energy uh, target of our uh, electric, our thermal, and our transportation. Across that board, 90% uh, renewables by the year 2050. Uh, in order to meet that target, thermal energy is a big piece of it, and wood heat and wood energy and CHP play a, a big big opportunity in that. So with that framing, um, what I'd like to do is introduce our panelists, and then each panelist will have about 20 minutes of their prepared remarks. Uh, we'll have a little time for Q&A after each speaker, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end to open it up to, to the full uh, panel. Uh, we have about a 90-minute session, and uh, really excited that you join us. And so our first speaker today is uh, Dutch Dresser. Dutch is the Managing Director of Maine Energy Systems. Uh, they are a premier uh, importer and, and manufacturer of an Austrian pellet boiler system. And um, yeah, with that, I will turn it over to Dutch. Take it away. Yeah. Let me see if I can get that machine right. I'll try to help. Here's a PDF, right? Yeah. Good morning. I'm uh, happy to be here in Vermont. I've, I've watched the work that everyone's doing over here since we began a long time ago and have been very impressed. I'm, I'm uh, particularly impressed with the penetration in, into institutions for, for uh, wood heat that, 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 that's been accomplished here in the state, largely due to folks like Adam. Uh, I, I, I'd like to claim the same sort of success for penetration at that level in Maine, but I can't. We're, we're working on that. I'd like to do a couple of things today. I'd like to introduce you to uh, a technology that you may be unfamiliar with, uh, to talk with you about the growth rate of that technology and the directions in which it's tending, and then to talk about its current state of affairs, which is movement toward uh, micro CHP in, in virtually all products. Uh, let's, let's take a look first then at, at a short timeline. I'm, I'm extremely interested in, in rate of growth in technological things and I hadn't thought about wood heat as one of, the, one of the realms in which I could have those thoughts, but in fact it is. Uh, the, the company that we represent and for whom we're the North American uh, manufacturer is called Ercofane, which stands for Ecological Research and Development. It's an Austrian company. 
Uh, and it's the company that produced the first small-scale automatic, that, that word has lots of uses in this industry, <laughs> automatic pellet boiler in 1998. Uh, a fellow named Herbert Ortner built that boiler, uh, having, having dabbled with chip boilers along the way, knowing that pellets were coming along. He produced the one on the lower left in 1998 and put it in the marketplace. Since that time, the development curve has been hockey stick-like, uh, and it turns out that these companies are, this particular company uh, is a technology company as opposed to a, an appliance manufacturing company. And I draw that distinction because of the, their level of commitment to R&D. We've been representing them now for eight years, and in that period of time, there have been at least as many product improvement cycles, which creates all sorts of interesting puzzles that we can talk about as we go along. But if you look at this, at this sweep, we went in the course of 20 years from a, a very simple device on the lower left uh, to an automatic device that's very common now, uh, and lots of them exist in Vermont, uh, to some newer styles that are condensing, to some newer styles that have Stirling engines to produce electricity, uh, and all the while developing newer storage systems for more efficient use of volume. So the, the company has been about producing change in technology in this industry, uh, and we'll, we'll take a look at how that goes. This is what I think of as modern wood heat. I'm showing our products not, not as a sales guy, but because I'm most familiar with them. There are lots of good pellet burning appliances on the market today, and there are lots of lousy pellet burning appliances on the market today as well. And that's a real issue for the industry. Uh, if I told any of you you could have a large, uh, a, a large grant to go out and buy a pickup truck today, there's nobody in the room who wouldn't know which pickup truck he wants and why he or she wants it. Nobody. If I, if I made the very same offer about a pellet-fired central heating system, there are very few in the room who would know what they want and why they want it. This is a real challenge to the industry because it often allows inferior products to hit the marketplace at a low price point, completely screw up the market, and leave town. So you have to be really careful about, about these appliances. There are lots of good ones. This is one of them. This is our Pelomatic. Uh, this, this boiler, just so you can understand what you're looking at, over here on the, uh, the right-hand side is a, a day hopper, we call it. That's filled by that, that's a vacuum turbine on the top. That vacuum turbine sucks pellets from the larger storage unit to fill this, this up uh, based on temperature, demand, heat demand, and so forth. This may fill a couple of times a day. Uh, the, the boiler is then, the, the burner is then fed from this unit. There's a little auger here. Uh, that's driving pellets down and allowing the pellets, the, the, right here, the pellets are underfed into the burner and they burn in a little pile, about as big as your hand, right here. They gasify down at this level so that volatile gases are driven off at a relatively low temperature and then secondary combustion occurs up here. So it's less than a thousand F down here and at 16 or 1700 F up here, so that you don't melt stuff on the, on the burner plate down below. The ash drops off into the bottom, is augered into a storage box, which you can see right there, and you, you empty that every two and a half tons of pellets that you burn, uh, and it has the consistency of talcum powder and the chemistry of lime. So you can use it in your garden, on your lawn, whatever you need to do with it. It, it has the consistency of lime at about three-quarter strength. 
So that, in my view, that's what modern wood heat looks like. Uh, it comes in all sorts of configurations. The little guy on the left uh, heats most small, well-insulated residences just fine. We call it a 20 kilowatt boiler. It goes up to 32 kilowatts. We talk in kilowatts. Most people talk in BTUs. 34 to 110,000 BTUs. The furnace is a variant on the boiler. Uh, furnaces produce hot air. Boilers produce hot water. You'll hear people use the terms interchangeably. Really, they aren't. Uh, the, 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 meat, the heated medium makes the difference. So furnaces heat water, uh, furnaces heat air, boilers heat water. And this is the largest of our line of boilers, uh, 56 kilowatts, a couple of hundred thousand BTUs, heats very large, large homes, and we can use it in other ways as well. I, I made the comment a bit ago that automatic gets various, uh, various uses in this industry. Automatic to me means that the boiler feeds itself from large volume storage, uh, that it starts and stops itself based on demand, that it modulates its heat output based on need. So this, these boilers will produce heat from 30% of their peak load up to 100% of their peak load and modulate up and down over 17 different levels depending upon actual demand making your use of fuel most efficient. Unlike conventional oil boilers that are either <coughs> roaring or not roaring. And the, an automatic boiler, in my view, also de-ashes itself. That is, it cleans the ash from its bottom, puts it in a storage container that's easy for you to, to empty, whether the boiler is running or not. The ash in there is cool. You can take it off any time. I'd be perfectly happy to take it off as I'm dressed now, dump it into the receptacle that comes with it. it. Takes two minutes to do the job, and you're done. And you put it back, and you visit it again in another six weeks. I, I, I do mine probably four or five times a year. And I have a big, old, leaky main farmhouse. We produce various, th these are used in various ways. This is, this is an interesting slide, and I put it in here because of the kind of conference we're at. People in other rooms are talking about CLT, cross-laminated timber. I was at a, a similar conference in Maine about three weeks ago where there was grand enthusiasm about CLT, and it, it hadn't occurred to me that it was new, sort of new in the, in the lumber market. We've been making these energy boxes, we call them, of CLT for about eight years. Uh, we've had to go, we've, it, it is the way the Austrians have been doing it for a very long time, and we had to go to northern Quebec to get our CLT for these, for these projects. Uh, it's, it's a great product. It works really well in this application, and it's nice to look at. So it, it's very supportive of the uh, forest products industry. This particular energy box, the, the beauty of these energy boxes is that they reside outside the heated building. Uh, they hold both the fuel and the boilers, uh, and they can be set on a pad, plugged in, wired up, uh, hooked to the heating system, hooked to the circulation of the building, and running in a day's time. Very common practice in Europe. Uh, and we've, we've sent a lot of these to the Northwest Territories of Canada uh, where they're used for lots of things. My, my uh, fondest thought about the boilers in the Northwest Territories of Canada is that there's one dormitory there uh, that has 10 of our boilers in it for heating the oil field workers. <laughs> When we talk about technological development by this company, this is a product that they've developed uh, very recently at our request. It's two boilers in one skin. This is really a cascade of boilers in one skin and hooked up as one boiler. You notice one, one venting system. If you got around to the back, you'd see there's one connection to the hydronic system of the house. Uh, this allows for double the heat load in, a, in a, a nice, tidy, small package. We do lots of multi-boiler 
uh, installations for various size buildings. Uh, and this, this, is, this will be a lovely addition to the suite for, it, it will save plumbers a lot of time and a lot of piping, uh, save, save money along the way. It's, a, it's an interesting product. What's going on right now in this technological development, is, I, I would call uh, miniaturization. If, if uh, I, I spent a fair amount of time in the IT world and miniaturization was the talk all the time. Everything was getting smaller and more powerful. This is, this is sort of a miniaturization phase. These boilers are noticeably smaller uh, than others that we've had. The Pelomatic Condense over here on the left is not a 20 watt boiler as the type as the typo would suggest. It's a 20 kilowatt boiler. Uh, the, this is a condensing boiler. Uh, for those not in the trade, it, when you drive down the street in, in, in Vermont in the winter and you see plumes from the chimneys, if it's a good clean fire, that's not smoke at all. That's condensation uh, that's coming from the, from the burning f fuel. Uh, that represents a fair amount of heat. If you can condense that water vapor in the boiler instead of in the sky, you can recover most of that heat. So this boiler does exactly that, as do many of our boilers now. They condense that water vapor in the boiler, and you get a little trickle of water that you need to dispose of uh, f from that condensation pro process and you recover that heat. And depending upon the return, the, the temperature of the returning water, you, you can increase your efficiency four or five percent uh, with, that, with that condensing unit. We could talk a lot about, about uh, efficiencies right at this moment, but I'll avoid that. Um, <clears throat> no, I won't, I won't avoid it because when you go to buy that pickup truck, one of, the, one of the things you'll be confronted with possibly is two different standards of measurement of efficiency. Here in the US, when we, when we talk about the efficiency of one of these boilers, we talk about all of the energy that's in the pellets as the baseline. When the Europeans talk about it, they talk about all the energy that's in the pellets except that which is consumed to boil off the water. So it's this boiler right here, this Pelomatic Condense, if you looked at its European testing, it would report that it has an efficiency of 104%. Sort of a hard idea to wrap your head around. We, we would talk about it as a 92% boiler, 92% efficient boiler, because we, we know there's heat going somewhere else. So when you see somebody advertising a non-condensing boiler as 90% efficient or more, they either aren't telling you which standard they're using or they don't know the difference. Be, be careful to, to check. The Pelomatic Smart, uh, this, the, both of these sit in our warehouse right now. They're awaiting listing which is a really interesting topic we could spend hours talking about. This, this boiler is also a condensing boiler. It has a mass thermal storage tank built in. Some states, some require mass thermal storage tanks, also another lengthy, deep topic that we can't discuss right now. But this one has it built in. Uh, the, the mass thermal storage tank is part of the unit, and the Domestic hot water is attended to much like on-demand oil boilers take care of it. There's a flat plate heat exchanger right up there in that boiler. So when somebody turns on a hot water faucet in the house, water begins to trickle by that flat plate heat exchanger and you get hot water on demand that's heated instantly by that boiler and you're not storing hot water in a, an indirect tank that's losing, losing heat all day long. It's, it's a really slick unit. The latest, the very latest in development in these products is in uh, CHP. These boilers 
have the, the boiler that you're familiar with. You can buy the boiler with or without the Stirling engine. And then you can put the Stirling engine in, and this boiler will produce electricity as it produces thermal energy. This, this is a small one. This is the 20 kilowatt size boiler, uh, which would heat most small residences. Uh, it will also produce up to a kilowatt of electricity. Uh, generally speaking, at 600, 700 watts is more, more likely for, for uh, ordinary production. I need to say, be, be sure when you start thinking about power production from these that you recognize the power production is heat load driven. So when you need a lot of heat, you'll get the most electricity, and when you don't need much heat, you won't get as much electricity. This electricity can either be put directly to the grid or put into battery storage for your, for your own use. Either, either one works, not a problem. This is the larger one. Uh, this is a 60 kilowatt boiler, fairly large. Uh, the, the interests we get in this are from greenhouses, people with large pools, swimming pools, those sorts of things, folks that are going to need uh, a lot of heat year-round. Uh, this, this produces up to five kilowatts of electricity. We find in ordinary use heating our warehouse, we get three and a half to four kilowatts routinely of thermal, of uh, electric energy. In larger applications, we've talked already a little bit about cascades. This is what they look like, and this is an ideal spot for one of those, one of those boilers. As the lead boiler in a cascade, if you have an, an electric energy producing boiler, you'll get as much electric energy from it as you ever could uh, because it will be running most of the time. A couple of little quick uh, impact statements. In Austria, they've been hard at changing thermal energy production from oil to biomass to solar to wind. Uh, this is the result of, of 13 years' worth of change from oil heat, gen generally oil heat, to an increase in biomass heat. You can see the number of boilers has gone from from zero to 7,000 in that 13 years in, in, this, in, in the country. And you can see what's happened to fine dust emissions. The top one is, is PM10, the bottom one is PM2.5. And you can see that there's been a precipitous <coughs> drop in fine dust emissions for two reasons. One, one the, the boilers are very clean, clean, cleaner than older oil boilers and because there's less transportation involved in moving pellets to, to, heat, to heat buildings because you can't move them very far and still have them worth the price. So pellets are burned more or less locally. The, the model there, and this is my last slide, the model there is to put solar PV on the roof and a generating boiler in the basement so that you're making power all day. Now the Austrian latitude is somewhere around two and a half degrees north of us, so their solar gain would be a little less than ours. Uh, even at that, uh, you'll notice this house, if you look down here in the bottom, it's hard to see, but there are two colors of yellow. This lighter yellow uh, starting here and here, this, this is the boiler producing electricity. In the middle, this is the sun producing electricity. There's some overlap in here. The jagged black lines are electric power consumption in the house. And the blue line is battery state in the house. And you'll notice this was a day in February where the average outdoor temperature was 25 Fahrenheit. And the power from the grid was zero kilowatt hours. So this is the target audience in, in Europe, I think we might think about getting there ourselves one of these days. Thank you for your time. Any clarifying questions for, for Dutch on the technology at the residential scale? Please go ahead. Um, most of the houses that I've ever been in, in the state 
you spurt us is not worth it. Sure. Including my own. Sure. Um, I installed 10 years ago a Harman PF100 uh, furnace yeah. in my house. Yep. I'm very, very happy with it. Yep. At the time, the government had a tax credit purchase, yeah. uh, which, gave, which gave me credit for 30% of the cost of the hardware. Right. The whole thing cost me, including the labor and extra ductwork I had in, about four thousand dollars. Right. Um, the my understanding is that comparable or more automatic furnaces uh, today are substantially more expensive than that. That's true. Um, and I might guess my question is why are they substantially more? The Harman is a quality product. I've had almost no issues with the whatsoever. And it's about as automatic as I'm happy with. Right. I mean, what is, what is the re even, uh, uh, by the way, Harman doesn't make them anymore. Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, which is a real shame. Yeah. Uh, but my, my question is, A, why are current furnaces, not boilers, uh, as expensive as they are, and are all of them available today pretty much in the same cost? Uh, on the second question, the answer is no. Uh, there are some very expensive products made in Canada uh, that are in the, in the old carbon price range and, and have the same uh, level of technicality. Okay. Simple devices, uh, inexpensively built, requiring, I call them hobbyist devices because you've got to want to play with it. The, the, the more, the more Technical ones are, are indeed fully automatic. You play with the thermostat only and dump smash them on that. Yeah. I don't do a whole lot more than that with my PF100. I, mean, I, I dump the ash once, once, once a year in the season. I go through five to seven uh, tons of pellets yeah. over the, the course of the season, depending upon how severe the winter is. And it, 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 it has a thermostat and all the rest of it. I believe you understood. I've heard only good things about those hybrid furnaces. Uh, we, we are the, the reason there is an America Fan Furnace. Uh, we got her to up by the ear and said, there are furnaces in our world. They only made boilers. They're, they don't use furnaces in Europe. Right. I said, we need a furnace. And he said, OK. And he went out and bought a harm and took it to Europe and said, I, I won't build that. It's got a sheet metal heat exchanger. Uh, he wasn't happy with that. He wasn't happy with safety implications of a sheet metal heat exchanger. So what they did was really fascinating to me. The heat exchanger in the boiler is a torus. It's a, it's a cil cylinder and a cylinder with cylinder penetrating, right? They simply took the outside skin off that boiler vessel. So the heat still comes up the middle, still goes up through the heating tubes, and they collect the heat right off the outside of a very substantial steel vessel. So it's, a, it's an entirely different level of product, and it is just about twice as much fun. Well, not, just out of curiosity, I'm not lying to <laughs> What is what the ballpark figure for the one uh, furnace that you have on the screen? Yeah, just about twice as much as your arm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mike just commented, we've been in business about 14 years, and you've definitely got the exception of the rule with the harm. They, they have a tendency to be uh, fairly high maintenance and low uh, low they're not, long, not very long service. They're like, not high maintenance if you do if you as the owner do the maintenance you're supposed to do. <laughs> which, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, <laughs> which I think is a doctor's question. There's quite a bit of creative <laughs> intervention. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to move on to our next panels before I do I'd also just add one point that um, a lot of the, the performance of efficiency and emissions uh, are really important in that the new modern systems uh, are an order of magnitude lower emitting. And so right now there are state rebates that oftentimes are between five and sometimes over to thousand dollars on the table towards a fasting class system that creates a leveling of the playing field to encourage more of the market to strive to the fasting class equipment. So I think uh, that's another important consideration to put on the table. So with that, I'd like to move on. If there's more questions for Dutch, what we can do is come back to that when we open it up after, at the end for the full panel. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Jack Byrne. Jack's the Director of Sustainability Integration at, at Middlebury College. Um, Jack is gonna give us uh, an overview of a system that Middlebury put in nine, 10 years ago, almost a decade ago, uh, as an innovator and leader in 
uh, sustainability and looking at carbon footprint reduction. Um, Middlebury College has done a great system and uh, we're kind of bookending the other end of the spectrum, moving from the residential scale CHP to now a very large steam driven CHP uh, technology. So with that, John, take it away. Thank you all. And Dutch, thanks. You kind of just kind of gave the miniature version of what I'm going to tell you more about. I'm going to kind of give you, how many of you have toured our facility? So a good number of you are familiar with what it's about. I'm going to walk you through it a little bit, um, talk about how it has played a role, not just in our effort to be carbon neutral and do other things to make the local economy and the college and its operations more sustainable, but also um, the role it's played in our being an educational institution is an important element to what we do, obviously. And um, if there's time, try to give you a glimpse of where we're going next now that we've got to carbon neutrality, the way we define carbon neutrality. So um, just a little context. The biomass plant uh, serves about 1.8 million square feet of filled space. The college has about 2.5 million square feet. Um, this is about two-thirds of the main campus in Millbury. You're not seeing a portion off to the, the left side, which is where the arts and facilities uh, buildings are. Um, and it also serves those buildings as well. Um, I'll talk about this a little later, but the, the college also has its Red Love campus up in Ripton and the Green Mountain, uh, adjacent to the Green Mountain National Forest. Uh, where we do a lot of summer programming, and that's played a, a significant role more recently in carbon neutrality. <coughs> so um, when we were talking about uh, switching from two and a half million gallons of fuel oil a year to something that would be considered carbon neutral back in 2005, 2006, one of the options that we explored was biomass. And uh, through a fairly lengthy process, we decided that that was a risk worth taking. And one of the questions was, do we build a separate building to house the biomass system, or do we connect it to the existing fuel oil plant? And the two big drivers that led us to put it on the existing system is the steam, the steam system we have, installing new piping is $1,000 a foot. So for every foot away from the existing plant, we have that much more cost. The other was that with the existing plant, we could use the smokestack. And if we built it separately, that would be a new smokestack in somebody's neighborhood. And the permit process probably was going to be a bit challenging. Um, so just to give you a, a look at it, so upper left, the original um, plant, and then on the right, biomass plant being built. Uh, and then a couple of views of what it looks like today. We, we gave it a glass plate uh, facade so that you could see very clearly what's inside the building and could perhaps spark some curiosity about what's going on in there. <clears throat> um, just to give you a little bit of a, an idea of how it flows, um, we get um, um, semi-truck loads of wood chips with live bottom floors that drop the chips into a bunker uh, we have a conveyor system that carries the chips up to uh, a gasifier. The gasifier is a chip tech gasifier. Are they still in business? No. Um, we, were one of, we were the first, I think, of that size, Adam. Um, I, I can tell you that in our nine, ten years of operating it, um, we've learned a lot about what was wrong with the system, and we've done a lot to make it right. Uh, so um, I, I think we've got uh, We've made modifications and additions to this to make it safer, better operating. We've got patents on some of that stuff. That'd be nice if the boilers were still there, but the patents could apply to it. But uh, that uh, gasifier um, creates uh, you know, gas, just as the system Dutch was describing earlier. Uh, that gas gets uh, ignited. It um, flashes water in a boiler into steam, the steam um, goes through combine some turbines that power about 20, 15 to 20 percent of our need. Uh, it goes around the campus uh, as low pressure steam, and then the 
condensate comes back into the plant, goes through a heat exchanger, which is carrying the waste heat from the combustion process uh, to get a little more efficiency out of it, and then through some uh, filtering filter system to remove the particulates, and then on out to the atmosphere. Um, few looks at the uh, plant itself, the delivery end of it. I'll say a little more about source later, but right now we're sourcing uh, primarily from Lathrop in Bristol and Johnson uh, in, in Bristol. Uh, we get a variety of uh, mill residue, we get uh, chipped trees, you know, various sources. Um, we've, over the years, tried to get a better handle on exactly where our chips are coming from in terms of lot by lot. Uh, but that's proven difficult. Um, it's a conveyor system. Um, it looks different today. This box is no longer open so that you can see the chips to cut down on the dust that comes off of that conveyor system. Um, looking at the gasifier from the <coughs> feed end, the, these are the chips coming across and down into two distribution boxes, each of which have two augers that feed chips into the gasifier at a rate that all the sensors and machinery in the system are saying to feed. Um, there's the boiler uh, sitting behind the gasifier. There's a coupling in between those two pieces of equipment where air is injected, that gas is ignited, and um, the flame boils the water, goes away as steam. Um, if you can see it, the heat exchanger uh, sits above this yellow box where the condensate comes back in to, to feed the boiler again and gets reheated on the way in. This is the bottom of the bag house uh, filtration system. We have a, a centrifugal system that care, captures some of the bigger particulates and then the rest goes through a pretty significant filtration system. We had a fire in that bag house uh, about two years into operating the, the system. Um, the best take on it was that there was a backdraft into the uh, bag house from the bottom. There was some hot ash in there, and it, it stoked it enough to start the filters on fire. So we, uh, the guys who operate the plant, uh, designed and, and built a, a backdraft, a double chamber backdraft preventer that sits at the bottom of that today. Um, just another look at it. So when we started out, talk about supply, it's great to be in a room with people who know a lot more about this than I do. Um, <laughs> but um, we thought we could go for a, we wanted ideally a single source of chips that were FSE certified or SFI or some fairly legitimate certification. Um, we you know, looked for a long-term contract, fair price, 50 mile radius, and then we needed a supply almost just in time. Our bunker can hold about two days at peak demand. Um, we didn't want to build a separate building and store chips and have equipment to do that. Um, the reality was that we uh, couldn't find that uh, single source certified. Um, we had to go to multiple sources, um, some of which were certified, some of which weren't, but we didn't have a great deal of knowledge about what those were. Um, pricing was pricing. Uh, we ended up within a 75 mile radius and we were able to get it almost always when we needed it. Um, we started out hiring a chip broker. Um, and we worked with them for three to four years. Um, tried to uh, get, again, a better uh, handle on the exact nature of the chips. We, we were for a while getting information about what town they came from and maybe the road, so that if we wanted to go look and say what kind of a, a logging operation was this, how did it go, we could do that. Um, we did a little of that, but um, the cost and the, the time of doing that for everybody involved was somewhat challenging. Um, so essentially, we're relying on the good forestry practices of everybody else in the supply chain and hoping that it's right. Um, we did a, a, some study uh, going into this. Adam and the Burke Center um, did a lot with us. We wanted to make sure that our 20 to 25,000 tons a year was going to be a sustainable amount, that it wasn't going to start cutting into um, other uses and that it wasn't going to compromise the, the forest. Um, and you know, we've checked into that over time. Again, you all know more about this than, 
than I do, but um, you know, we're in a place where you know, maybe we're still net growth positive in our forests, but maybe we're at an inflection point. Um, no, not close. Not close. Don't have to worry about it. Okay, we're still good. Then, then we can still claim carbon neutrality. I mean, and, and I, some of you know, I don't want to get too deep into this, but um, plenty of controversy about is wood carbon neutral, right? Uh, the assumption is that you know, for every tree you burn, then a new one grows in its place, and that kind of depends on where you're drawing your boundaries and, and so on. But we're comfortable. Um, we set a goal to be carbon neutral by 2016. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and um, you know, for where we are um, in Vermont, in a place that has significant renewable wood resources uh, and a net growth of our forests, we're comfortable saying it's carbon neutral. There's a lot of contention around that, and we, we acknowledge that. Um, just a little bigger step back uh, to look at the college. The college is 2,500 students. It's about 350 faculty. It's almost 1,000 staff people. So it's a small Vermont town in scale. And so this plant and the other things related to providing heat and power um, has to serve the needs of those many people year-round. We're a year-round campus. Um, we don't just have a nine-year academic uh, schedule. We have a, a summer language school program that fills the campus completely. So this thing operates all the time. And our peak demand for energy in the summer can be greater than our peak demand in the winter because of air conditioning and power that's needed during the hottest times of the year or hottest times of the summer. So, um, but if you, I'll come over here first. So our energy consumption is almost 60% heating and then cooling and cooking. Um, the vehicles, the, the fleet that the college owns of its own vehicles, plus the travel that we pay for. So the college pays my mileage to come here to this conference, or my plane trip to Colorado to talk about biomass. We calculate the energy and the carbon involved in that, and we include it in our total. So that maybe a little bit more electricity that we consume and then the waste we put in the landfill. Um, our energy supply is, you can see, nearly over two-thirds wood chips. Um, we get our electricity from Green Mountain Power. Um, we were burning fuel oil. This is this piece up here. Um, that has tapered off significantly because of biomass and because natural gas came to Middlebury by way of the Vermont gas system pipeline that came down from Colchester. Um, and then some diesel, some gas, and then some propane. And then we have some solar. We do about 8%, 7% of our electricity now is solar that are from projects we're partners in and a tiny little bit of wind. Um, this, I'll try to make this simple, um, but I just wanted to show you how we got to carbon neutrality. And how are we doing on time, Adam? Four okay. Um, so this represents our carbon footprint, which in a lot of ways represents our energy consumption. Um, in 2008, um, we were emitting 30,000 metric tons of carbon, most of it in the form of fuel oil to heat and power the campus, and then um, some smaller portions from number two oil gasoline, propane, diesel, our travel, and, and landfill. Uh, waste we put in the landfill that generates methane. Biomass came online in 2009, and so over that period of time, most of this decrease in that portion of the, the carbon footprint was due to our getting better and better at operating the biomass system. Um, we had this goal, 2016, carbon neutrality, well, I'll mention too, um, we, did, we did a lot of efficiency work. Um, we did about 87 projects that we spent about two and a half million dollars on, saves us 600,000 a year, uh, cut our consumption of electricity by four and a half million kilowatt hours, uh, and then these solar projects I mentioned. But we were counting on 2014, 2013, we had gotten involved in a project to take um, manure um, and put it in a digester and create natural gas, renewable natural gas, and pipe it to the college 
to displace all the other fossil fuels that we were burning. Um, and then we would get credits for the avoided methane emissions from the manure lagoons, and that was going to get us pretty close to our neutrality goal. That project didn't get its financing in time for our 2016 goals, but we had um, in 2014 permanently conserved uh, about 2,400 acres of forest land that the college owned up at the Red Love campus. Put an easement on it, gave it to the Vermont Land Trust. That made us eligible to quantify all the carbon on those lands and put it on the American Carbon Registry's voluntary carbon market, which meant we could buy back a number of credits, the number of credits we needed to offset our current emissions and become neutral, carbon neutral. So this is just a table kind of showing you um, how many total carbon credits we're projecting over the next seven years um, the number of credits we will buy back to achieve neutrality, and then the number of credits that will remain to be sold on the American Carbon Registry. And right now those credits are at about $10 a credit. Um, if this is the actual schedule because this is projecting out in the future. We know that won't be the case. Uh, but on those assumptions, we'll come out about $150,000 in the black on this. So. Um, uh, I'm just going to mention quickly, um, so now that we're beyond carbon neutrality, or where are we going, what are we doing, uh, my office has been working um, on a plan for uh, what our goals should be for 2026, you know, the next 10 years, and uh, we're shooting for a 25% uh, reduction in consumption of, of energy getting to 100% renewable sources, which I think is very is doable. I think we can get there. And then to do it responsibly and uh, use our educational resources and, 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 and mission to do that. Um, we said we do it responsibly. We mean carbon neutral. We do it transparently. That it builds more resilience in the campus system to climate change. And we try to do it as equitably as possible and then we capitalize on the educational resources on the campus. Happy to talk more about all that stuff later. Um, done. Thank you, Dave. Uh, before we open up for uh, questions, part my questions on the content, um, you mentioned the cooling portion of the campus's load. Can you just quickly touch upon how the biomass fuel boiler feeds into that cooling load via the absorption generation? Sure. Um, you just told me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a topic I know a lot about, but we do um, about half the campus's air conditioned through the steam system, um, and use um, air no air absorption chillers. Yeah. Air absorption chillers um, require the steam as a, a, a source to drive that process. So that's why we have the demand. Um, we put in seven hundred air conditioning window units for the summer. Uh, and so there's a significant opportunity there looking at the efficiency of that versus maybe a more standard system that we're working with as well. So questions for Jeff? 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 Um, you alluded uh, to the fact that not everyone is a fan of biomass uh, energy. Um, and I'm curious, how much have you faced much pushback from within the Middlebury community, either you know, administration, um, alums, or just others, uh, you know, on particularly that thorny topic of carbon neutrality, and how have you, uh, so have you faced it, how have you dealt with it, and how optimistic are you about being able to continue to, to hold that line? Because it, yeah. it is a, I will say, I don't buy into any of that, but it's a, it is a headwind, I think, that we face sure. uh, in continuing to boost use of wood for energy. Right, yeah, I think, you know, we've tried to be as transparent as possible about to say, look, you know, this is how we're defining it. We understand that that's contentious. Um, and, and acknowledge that in the future, we may not be able to continue to claim carbon neutrality based on our definition of it. And so part of our thinking has to be, all right, you know, over the next eight to 10 years, what else can we do to move toward a true reduction in emissions? Um, and, you know, I, don't, I don't think we have any other that, that's our approach at this point. Yeah, I agree fully. Yeah, John. Um, you, you mentioned.
mentioned a couple of different times where uh, your staff had to be creative and fix something, create something. Uh, and I'm curious on the kind of the running of these plans. It's my understanding that everyone's a little different, whether it's Millbury College or Burlington High School or the Montpelier State House. What's your view of where these folks are coming from and that are operating the plants, and are they learning what they need to learn to operate biomass facilities? It's a really challenging part of this. Um, so um, you need talent. You know, people understand this stuff. It's much more complex than an oil boiler, right? Many more moving parts, much more going on that you have to keep track of. Um, we've had um, we had trouble finding qualified people to, to come in and fill these positions on a timely basis. So um, that that's a challenge. Um, we've had uh, higher eds going through some challenging times. You know, we have fewer kids going to college, so you see enrollment becoming more competitive. We're fortunate so far that you know, we had 9,000 applicants for 600 seats last year. But nonetheless, you know, we're um, looking at people saying how much value and relevance is there in a you know, higher education or a liberal arts education, and should I be sending my kids to this for <coughs> totally different? And other colleges are feeling that. In fact, we're starting to sort of, we're preparing for, you know, this is a possibility we need to think about staffing and what we teach and so on. So all that stuff sort of figures into, you know, the infrastructure of the college and how we operate. And, but yeah, the personnel side is really significant. And the learning curve, a system like this, you know, it took two, three years to get to the point where it was running well. So I know there's a bunch more questions. What I'd like to do is make sure we have ample time for our last panelist. Uh, I'll introduce him, but please remember your questions. We'll come back to Jack and we'll have uh, another opportunity for five, ten minutes at the end for the full panel. Uh, so thank you, Dutch. Thank you, Jack. Those are the two bookends on the biomass um, CHP spectrum. Um, I'd love to turn it over to Jeff Monder. Jeff Monder is the uh, innovation champion for Green Mountain Power uh, Utility here in the state of Vermont. Um, coolest job title ever, I think. <laughs> um, I should also say that in, in your packet, there's full bios on each of the panelists. I've been giving a pretty light introduction, um, but please, uh, Jeff, take it away. Okay, thank you. So, two biomass guys at a utility, what's the thread that ties this together? Um, we're all driven to, uh, to renewability. We're all driven to reduction in carbon footprint. We're all driven to saving money. And so I want to talk to you about a couple of programs that Green Mountain Power has that can do those things, help to reduce your carbon footprint, and save you money. Who, who here is on a time of use rate? Just a show of hands. What's that? Time of use rate. Time of use electric rate. Rate 65, rate 63. Green Mountain Power? <laughs> so, you know, now, now, this is not the kind of interactivity because I know for a fact that some of you are. <laughs> oh. um, we got to swap it. It's okay. Yeah. We got it. There we got it. All right. So, for those of you who are not admitting to be on a time constraint, <laughs> yeah. so th there's, there's, there's a reason for the existence of the time of use rate that, that seems odd because every month Green Mountain Power gets a bill for transmission services and it's based on the 15 minute period during that month when all of Green Mountain Power, Power's customers collectively are using the most power. So for that 15 minute interval, people are paying a peak demand charge based on 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday. That's wild, right? Okay, and every year Green Mountain Power gets a bill from New England, from ISO New England, which runs capacity. And that bill is based on the 15 minute period during the whole entire year when the most power is being Again, you're paying a higher price from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day, Monday through Friday, at your business to cover that cost to make sure that we are covering the cost for those intervals. 
and it's 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 kind of a blunt instrument, right? Because you're covering this wide space to hit those little periods of time. What I want to talk to you about is something that we have that can help us narrow in on that and provide some benefits to uh, to customers that are on these kind of use rates. Um, what is it worth? Every, uh, last year, the bill from the combination of, uh, of transmission from Velco and capacity from New England was $130 million. So we're talking about substantial money, and that's what's driving those, those demand charges. Okay, enough about that. So we have, we have an option, it's an approach, and it doesn't work for everybody, but it can work for a lot of companies. And um, <coughs> What it does, so, so the way Greenmount Power actually uh, actually works with this is we, have, we, we try to shoot for peak. And we try several times a month to shoot for this peak period. And what we shoot for it with is reducing with everything that we have control over, the amount of energy that customers are drawing. So who's familiar with our water heater program? Yeah? No, 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 no. There, there we go. <laughs> so our water heater program has been around for a long time, okay? And we control those water heaters and we drive those, we, we, we drive load down by leveraging those water heaters. And we're, so, that, so that's been around for a while and over the years, and especially recently, we've leveraged a few different technologies so that we can control those things and drive load down deliberately when we think peak is going to happen. Peak is probably going to happen today. Why? because it's going to be in the 90s, and it's a work day, and lots of energy is going to be used, okay? So, what we'll do is we'll dispatch, we'll control all of those devices that we can tell to shut off during the period, that time period, let's say from 4 to 9 tonight, that we think that peak is going to happen, okay? And We'll also we'll reach out to a bunch of customers that are participating in a program called the Curtailment Load Rider. It's a, it's a, it's a, a function that can be added onto your time of use rate. And those guys will all reduce their load during that period, okay? Each month we shoot for peaks. We do it five times or so on average each month and it's for a few hours. That's a lot better than 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday, if you can live with it. So, customer, customers are notified by 3 p.m. the day before, and there it is. What does it do for you? Okay. Oh, how do you access it? If you can curtail 25% of your load, or 500 kilowatts, whichever is smaller you can participate. You just have to be willing and committed to dropping that load during those periods of time when we ask you to. And there are a lot of different ways to do it. And we can talk about some of those as we go along. But what is it worth? So here's, here's a customer. He's got 216 horsepower of motor, okay? And he's on rate 65, and his hours of operation from 7 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., Monday through Friday. His on-peak kilowatt demand charge is based on 129 kilowatts. That's the peak that he had for this month. And his off-peak kilowatt demand is 20, because he doesn't really do much after 4.30. And uh, his consumption is 12,758 distributed between on-peak and off-peak. And if you take all of that information, and you multiply it by the applicable rates and the taxes and the fees and all of that stuff, you come up to about 26 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, so take all of those demand charges, all of those consumption charges, add them together, divide them, that's what you get. Now, you take that same customer and you put him on a curtailment load rider. You take his, his 129 kilowatts that, you know, was during peak times because it was that, that big window, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., and we've moved all of that to off-peak because he's participating in the curtailment load rider, okay? Now the off-peak demand charge is applying to every kilowatt of peak that he's hitting, okay? And because he was able to shed all of his load during the peaks that we called, he's got zero on peak. 
the demand charge. And look at the cost difference per kilowatt. It's fourteen ten per kilowatt on peak, and three dollars and eighty five cents per kilowatt off. So big honking difference. Right? Forty six percent savings. All right, is that simple? All right, pass it on. If you know people, if I, obviously nobody in this room is on a time of use rate, but if you know people that are, let them know because this can work for them. <laughs> All right, so the bottom line is it can save you money. And I'm not going to belabor the point. Um, how, do you, how do you take advantage of it? Give us a call. And we can get together. We can take a look at your electrical usage. And we can talk about how your business operates and what kind of measures can be used to curtail that load. And you may be able to do it. And it can save your own money. OK. The next thing I want to talk about, these I was just going to ask you about that. Yeah, come. You're going to pull off those. So if you've got, a, say, a, a large consumer, you tell me to come off, then I've got to have another. I've either got to shut the show down, or I got to have another source of power. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, yeah. I mean, you've either got to shut it down in it, and and it's not a complete shutdown. It doesn't have to be. It's got to be 25 percent in order to comply with the curtailment rider rules. Okay. How often does this happen in the in the in the, in the Experience. So we typically, we're typically, we, so we can actually share the schedule of the last whatever, however long we've been doing this program with you, so you can see every event that we've called. Typically, and especially in the last few years, they've been later in the day, after four. They're, they're, it's usually a three or four hour window, and we do it about five times a month. That's, that's kind of typical. And we've got folks that turn on generators during those curtailments. We've got folks that do other things. We've got folks that store stuff in batteries during those curtailments. There's a lot of different ways to comply with the curtailment and still maintain operations. OK, so tier three. So this is actually kind of tied to that, because now we're going to talk about something that we can do to support projects that offset fossil fuel. So who uses who uses diesel in their operations? I, I'm, I'm a fool because I just keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see some hands. I'll see some hands. All right. Who uses oil for heating space? All right. Lots of folks. Um, what we have. So so in 2015, the state passed Act 56. Act 56 corresponds to the state's renewable energy standard which fits with the state's clean energy plan. And this sets goals for the whole entire state to reduce carbon-based fuels. And Green Mountain Power is part of that. And as part of it, we have targets that we have to hit every year for projects, for energy transformation projects, that working with customers to reduce fossil fuel consumption. And what we can do is we can take those targets that we have and the penalties, I'm going to call them penalties, they're not technically called penalties, but I'll call them that, and the penalties that are associated with those targets and monetize them, right? We can turn them into incentives to work with customers to take on projects that may be capital intensive to offset fossil fuel. The simplest example of, the pro of a project, and it's one that we've done a number of, is working with a customer that's using a diesel generator to run operations, to create electricity so that they can run operations. And we got, we got our display out there with A. Johnson Company, and Ken was gracious to you know, let us tell his story. But, um, but I'm going to talk about a hypothetical rather than, rather than getting into the specific numbers for, for, his, for, for his project. I'll, I'll talk to you about a hypothetical project where a customer has a diesel generator. OK, they burn 11,000 gallons a year. They need a line extension, and that line extension is going to cost $75,000, including a little bit of work that the customer has to do to make that line extension happen. Based on that 11,000 gallons and the fact that a line extension going in to replace that diesel generator will last for 30, 40, 50, or more years, we can take the fossil fuel offset from that whole entire period, okay, monetize it into this year, into an incentive, and contribute $40,000 rebate to that project. Okay, these are round numbers, and we kind of depends on how different projects work, but that's real dollars to offset the cost of making that line extension happen. OK? 
okay? And it's based on a relatively modest amount of fossil fuel compared to a lot of these generators that we've seen running. We can do this kind of work. Now, the diesel generator is a simple illustration of how that works. We can do this kind of project for heat offsets. We're working with a greenhouse right now that burns a lot of propane to heat the space. And, and they have like a hydronic heating system and we can, we can put in some really high efficiency heat pumps and, uh, and, and do that. Now if you take something like this and you couple it with that curtailment load rider, okay, it becomes very competitive with the cost of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And, it's, and it, can, it can be a really good move. Does it work in every single case? I haven't come across one that it doesn't work with yet, but I know that there are ones where it won't work. Natural gas is hard to compete with, for example. Okay. What else? Oh, this is a good reminder for me. We, we work really closely with Efficiency Vermont. And while what I'm talking about with you is a program that uses strategic electrification, in other words, replacing fossil fuel plant with electric plant, uh, Efficiency Vermont has also some programs where they can do it with biomass, and I know that's near and dear to a lot of folks. Here's hard. And so we work very closely when we approach customers, commercial and industrial customers, with these opportunities. We're, we're really kind of looking for what is going to be the best match for that customer. What works out dollars-wise, what works out in terms of their operational realities. Um, what works out well with the practicalities of their goals. And so um, we've, we've been working closely with Efficiency Vermont. They bring a lot of science to it. They've got some great engineers on staff. And uh, so between the two of us, we collect our programs into a bundle and try to figure out what works best for the customer. And what are the results of all of this? So GMP right now is our, our energy portfolio is 60% renewable. 90% non-fossil fuel, okay? So when you go to GMP electricity, you're wiping out a whole bunch of carbon from your footprint. In 2017, we supported offsetting 570,000 gallons of diesel. That's an equivalent because there were a few different kinds of fuel in that mix. And it resulted in an annual carbon emission reduction of about 5,800 metric tons of carbon. That's a lot. It's about 1,200 gas-powered cars taken off the road forever. And our goals go up every year. Our targets get harder to hit every year. So we're looking for opportunities to work with you guys to make these projects a reality. That's it. Thank you. talking about um, you know how to do it but since we started working with EBT and they have a biomass incentive now we're really trying to focus on leveraging GMP's resources for strategic electrification and leveraging EBT's resources for biomass um, how does that how does that help uh, pellet stove incentives and, and like boiler incentives I'm, I'm, I'm not sure but but that's would it be something you'd be willing to look at you know Washington like Co-op is in a similar situation as well and have to share those those savings with EBT would be would be huge for our market right now, especially considering the low pricing also. Yeah, we've we've like I said, we've had some conversations on it, but we've been really focused on the electrification piece. Now let me say this. This program goes for goes through to twenty thirty two and the targets go up every year. So as the targets increase, our selectiveness has to decrease. So I, it, it may be that over the next two or three years, we'll be very open 
to biomass offsets, biofuel offsets, and, 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 and other kinds of projects like that. So I think it's worth keeping in the hopper for discussion. And, and, and we are talking about it. We talked about it a lot this year. We've had conversations with the Department of Public Service. And, and so it's, it's very much on our minds. Well, now's the time we really look at the low rate uh, markets and the cost of all these good Hopefully we can wait a couple years. Maybe we could come see you. Cost of fossil fuel. Yeah. Maybe we can get together and talk further about it. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm always open to talking. It means the champion of innovation. That's right. Exactly. Other questions? In the back. Uh, would you be more open this time around if there was indeed someone willing to build a large biomass plant? There would be power into you. I mean, like one of the reasons why they didn't build it back in 2011 or 12 was you didn't want to buy the power. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the question comes down to the numbers. And our driving, our, I guess our, our guiding star is what drives costs down for all rate payers, all electric customers. And if we can come up with a way to engage in a project like that, that will, you know, achieve that goal, support that goal. I, I, I think GMP would be very open to the discussion. So maybe we can switch gears. We have about uh, 18 minutes. Um, I'd like to open it back up to all the panelists. Um, so if you had questions for Jack and for Dutch and, and of course for, for Jeff, um, please, let's hear it. I knew there were a couple of hands when Jack was talking, so. Well, I, I'd like to comment on the uh, carbon neutrality of biomass, particularly for your benefit. Add some fuel to your fire, so to speak. <laughs> so um, there's a million cords of wood rotting in Vermont's forest every year. We're so releasing carbon with no energy benefit. It's the mortality issue. Right. right. And that number is going to increase because we're never going to harvest the growth rate the way things are going. And then in, in forestry operations, there's a huge amount of debris that's left that rots in you know, five to 15 years, again, releasing carbon. And so by what you're purchasing that ends up in your boilers is stuff that was going to rot anyway, and sometimes releasing methane, but certainly releasing carbon. So. Um, sure. Yeah, it's nice to be able to connect it to a sustainably managed, you know, SFI certified tree farm or, or whatever, but just across our landscape in a general sense. And the wood supply is way beyond. You, you guys, I mean, it's great what you're doing, but you're really, I'm sorry to say, just a drop of the Sure. I think, yeah, and I, I think we've been careful to uh, look at this from multiple scales, right? So on that scale, you know, I'm totally comfortable defending carbon neutrality. Look at what's going on in the southeast states with wood harvest and pelletizing and going over to Europe to England and some of those states. I mean, the energy economics of that is just absolutely you know, immoral. <laughs> and uh, economic, but well, apparently not. But um, so I think, you know, the other rationale, I believe, the rules for accounting, you know, and we're still in a voluntary market, right? I mean, you don't have to count carbon. We, we've voluntarily chosen to do so, as have many other people. So there's a set of rules that say you don't count the carbon of biomass at the point of combustion. You count it at the change in land use of the country. So, you know, in a way, that's a good incentive that uh, if we manage our forests well and we're careful about harvesting, we stay net positive. So yeah, we're kind of subject to the national and international protocols, but on uh, a local Vermont scale, you know, I'm perfectly comfortable with the carbon neutrality of what we're doing. Other questions out there? Yeah, go ahead. It is a somewhat different question. Uh, and, and you were speaking of, of the uh, uh, these boiler systems, 
and uh, I work as tax assessors, so uh, I, I see what's happening in, in houses. I think it's very difficult to retrofit an older house to accept one of these newer systems. I would guess probably 75 to 80 percent of our sales are retrofits. Uh, it, these will slide into the very second bowl of oil boiler comes out of. And the storage units, uh, if, you, if you think of a seven foot cube, uh, that, that space will hold three or more tons of pellets for storage. So that's about the space occupied by a couple of oil tanks. So the, the problem that we run into is low ceilings in basements, in the yeah. basements. Uh, we, we can accommodate that. Uh, but, but no, the, these boilers fit in the same chimney, in the same spot. They're not, they're not big boilers. They, they retrofit very readily. Just to follow up on that, could you, you showed that outdoor installation. Yeah. Could that readily hook up to an existing system, just removing the oil and then piping into where the old oil used to be? Yeah, absolutely. These, these burn a different fuel, but they're just a boiler. Uh, and hot water goes out and cool water comes back. It's just like any other boiler. Uh, so they can, they can pipe into the hydronic system of a propane boiler, a natural gas boiler, an oil boiler. It makes no difference. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, this question is for Jack Moore at Adams from the Northern Forest Center. Um, I used to work in campus sustainability, so I've kind of paid attention to what different schools are doing in that respect. And there, I'm just struck by how many schools and colleges have embraced wood heat as an environmental um, opportunity. And I've made that switch. There's, of course, you guys, which have really very you know, been a leader in this. Um, Dartmouth is going that way, UNH, um, Plymouth State, Hotchkiss School down in Connecticut. And yet, a lot of environmental groups still are very cautious around using wood for anything, even heat. And they just ask, well, what about cutting down the trees? And what about all this? And it just strikes me as a really funny dichotomy between those like sustainability leaders in higher education totally get it and are doing it, and yet these other groups like are not there yet. Do you? What do you do to try to address that? And why do you think it's there? Because I don't get it. <laughs> I think the, being very clear about how we define carbon neutrality has been really important. You know that there isn't there isn't one definition out there that everybody has agreed on represents what it is. So um, being really clear about the basis for our claim, which I've tried to do here in this conference, and then acknowledging that yeah, I mean it's debatable, right? If you, there are uh, valid points to make that it isn't so carbon neutral. So, um, you know, I think that's important rather uh, than to try to defend a claim that you know, has some flaws in it. Um, I think, you know, what's, what's interesting, so about 650 higher institutions have set carbon neutrality goals, varying lengths out in time. Um, those that are coming up against the current and near future deadlines that they've set for themselves are talking much more actively about offsets as a solution. And in effect, with that red load project I mentioned, we've created our own offsets, right? We conserve 2,400 acres of land that will never be developed. Some will argue that, oh, you would never have developed it anyway. So you can't really claim any difference. But the fact of the matter is, it could no longer be sold by the trustees at a time of economic distress for a development that could bring a lot of money to the college. It will remain forests, and the easement says so, and it very lim limits very much what can go on in those lands. So a lot of colleges and universities are coming up against their deadlines are saying, what offsets are out there for us to achieve our neutrality goals on time? And I think the way we've done this for those colleges and universities that have land resources or that can collaborate and be partners with, uh, there's an interesting project going on with um, Clarkson University and landowners in, in north, northern New York to aggregate their lands, their forest lands, pool them, try to pull them into a, a market, a carbon market, and then uh, Clarkson own 
with some of those offsets, and, and the landowners also receive some of the benefits. So, um, I think the various ways in which the, the pirate uh, institutions that are that care about this, and there are quite a few, uh, are going to find to get to find their way toward neutrality or some significant reduction in carbon that, that's legitimate, and they're all looking for something that they can defend, not something that's you know a greenwash kind of thing. So, I, I think it's pretty much in still kind of uh, maturation. Yeah, but I think it's coming close to where everyone says, okay, we all agree as I read, this is how we're going to define and describe this. Would you consider that um, a, a example a, a uh, response to uh, fragmentation of private forest land in a sense, or is it apples and oranges? Um, I, yeah, I hadn't thought about it. I think it can be. I mean, I think it does. Um, if you're a small lot owner of forest that you could aggregate with your neighbors and adjacent in the say, you know, registering the carbon on your collective forest lands, maybe that's enough economic incentive to say what well, I don't I'm happy to believe what it is. Um, um, so I'm curious at the time Millbury was proposing this plan, there was a lot of concern about the sustainability of the raw material of, of the wood. And uh, Dartmouth is going through the same struggles with you know, how are we going to defend the sustainability of the biomass. And so I'm curious, has that like become just old news and no one's talking about it anymore? Or is it still very much a concern for folks in the college? It's still a concern. It comes up here and there. I would say it's not a great concern. Um, I think what, what we have going for us is that in terms of if you're going to do this, what's the best way of doing it? I think we're in that category of, yeah, we're getting an incredible amount of efficiency out of this. Um, you know, I think that there's a, um, there's just an ongoing concern at the college and uh, uh, our reputation, I mean, an important part of who Middlebury is and its perception amongst its prospective customers is the sustainability part of what we do. And so we've got to be assured that there's integrity there. Um, so we're always watchful of, of that to make sure that you know, we're, we're not compromising our reputation by making claims or, or being you know, sloppy in the way we you know, quantify and, and tell our story. So um, you know, I think that's um, that question. Yeah, and the easement you mentioned, is that a that is set aside not to be managed, or is that a managed area where you're growing and harvesting wood on that 2,400 acres? Yeah, it's, it's been given to the Vermont Land Trust. There is a management plan. It, it's very limited in terms of the kind of harvesting that can be done. Ecological purposes, um, emergency purposes, in terms of you know, fire or, or you know, threat to something. Um, Recreational, educational, uh, you know, a whole range of traditional uses. Um, so so are, it's harvesting part of those uses then, or is it yes, but not down on the totem pole per se? It's probably in the lower end of the totem pole, and, and I've been, that we've that's been raised with us too. Is why aren't you more aggressively harvesting these lands for these purposes? And, uh, so that's a really quick question to Dutch and then to Jeff. Um, Dutch, you talk about technology and you talk about the kind of time of use of the generation of the electricity when you have the heat demand and when the sun goes down and the interface between solar uh, system on a roof and, and, and the CHP uh, system that you guys sell. It, it, it might be at a, at a project level that's a snapshot. But I'm, I'm kind of curious about how that scales up and, and um, how it's viewed if you have 100, uh, 1,000, 20,000 of these systems and thinking about it from the grid perspective, is that viewed as um, a favorable condition that you're trying to encourage uh, that type of interface or is that something that is a complicated wired mix? And I'm just thinking about like, how, how does that technology scale and how does it look from the utilities perspective? The uh, utility would have to answer from that perspective, I, I can't. Uh, but I, but I, I know from watching what, what goes on in Germany, which is a country that thinks about this perhaps before we do, uh, that they have 
Uh, first of all, they heavily incentivized solar solar installation, required it on all the buildings. Uh, then they backed off a bit on the incentivization. Uh, and in 2009, they began with the, with the carbon accounting. And at that point in time, they said that the best solution in their view was a toilet boiler in the basement and solar thermal on the roof. Uh, I'm sure that solar thermal has now become solar PV. Um, but they are, they're pressing heavily for all boiler types, not just wood pellet boiler types, but all boiler types to simultaneously uh, produce electricity. They fiddled with the idea of requiring that and haven't quite gotten there, uh, but they, uh, they talk about that quite a Jeff, from the community perspective, I think we look at it very similarly to uh, solar. And uh, it, the, the answer to your question is yes. I mean, it's complicated. But we welcome it. You know, it brings low to local, which is a good thing. It's uh, renewable, which is a good thing. So, yeah, I mean, our our um, the balance we seek is keeping rate pressures down, and uh, you know, for all customers, and providing opportunities for individual customers to you know take advantage of these technologies. So, all, all the so in terms of the electrical generation in winter, as we move to more strategic electrification, we'll see more heat pump, pump deployment. When we move to a summer peaking load to also a winter peaking load, winter generation from micro CHP to complement the timing of the solar could be a complementary. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, the grid's a big place, and there's, there's plenty for us to absorb those electrons. I think we saw some other hands up. Jack, um, see part of the golf course and President of the Mount Coast Residents Association and I really want to applaud the various efforts I've been there seen seen it work. Um, I also saw this you know ski racer coming to a Middlebury and say that and all those guys. But um, it's been a great working classroom to have for the Middlebury student, you know, these bright some of the brightest kids in this country come there and they see it, they see how this thing works. Understand it. It's also a great working classroom for academia to see reality of like, boy, we need chips in the gym. We get here <laughs> soon. Um, I can't because that chip man is frozen. <laughs> Those kinds of things. But the other thing is, too, is now that you guys have gone through this um, several years of working around this, um, the expertise that goes into making this thing run and the ingenuity of the, of the human capital and how to fix these things. That's one of the biggest tragedies that we, we potentially lose in a forced industry. You take the sawmills, you take the biomass plants, you take the paper companies, the people that make this stuff run. These are not uh, minimum wage jobs. These are highly technical skills set that we don't want to lose nurture that and your guys are going to have to start training in-house people to do this technology stuff because for me growing up in sawmills I'm just amazed at the technology I, and I'm just a great person. So that's yeah that's a great circle back to, to the, um, you know, the conversation earlier. Um, it reminded me that so these controversies about carbon neutrality and other things that they're, they're really rich for students and classes and faculty to say, okay, you know, let's pick up on the sustainability of our fuel supply and let's devote an entire class to have that done. So really looking at that. So so these challenges and, and issues really you know, just feed really nicely into the you know, purpose of the institution. Um, and I was thinking earlier that the comment of Christine Woman from Minnesota. The about firewood and, and, and so with our kind of research on the biomass system somewhere along the way somebody found a letter that was sent out to students in the 1800s freshmen coming in like what to bring you know the severity of the wrong winter so now make sure you have this is this plus you are responsible for bringing or procuring one quart of wood <laughs>
chip tech gas fire. We had a chip tech gas fire firing at 5 by 16 of that. So, and you really see the difference with the fuels that you get. Operators when they get different stuff like this. We brought in green ash chips. It's like awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and we've gone from taking any combination of hardwood softener really quickly, any combination to just hardwood. We love mill residue, we love poultry chips, or poultry <coughs> chips. And then chips, chips. Yeah. chips, we do not like poultry chips. In well, I don't want to cut the conversation short, but we are at our time. I'd like everyone to help thank the panel.